really great homesteading topic, fresh cut flowers. We're gonna go ahead and start recording now. Just wanna let everyone know. Let's do a little housekeeping first. If possible, please keep your microphones muted and your videos off unless you're talking or presenting. And we'll open up for questions after each of our two presenters. Anytime you'd like to type us a question in the chat box, that would be great. We can answer those questions as we go. And if you could share your email and name with us, or we'd like to know where you're watching us from this evening, and then we'll send you the recording after our webinar. So it's six o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started on our 10th in our series, Fresh Cut I was just told I lost audio when I switched screens. Um, we're gonna start off with some info about the Department of Agriculture's Business Development Division. Then we are gonna go to Milady Jane Cook from Spring Valley Farm and Orchards, and we'll take some questions from her. After that, Jenny Totten will be joining us. She owns Sweet Tater Farm and Florals, and she's gonna give us a great PowerPoint uh, presentation, and then we'll ask her some questions after that. First, we're gonna go into a little bit. Uh, here's our contacts for our presenters tonight. We can also show this again at the end and share with you after the presentation. But there's their contact information. This will also be on our YouTube channel. First, I wanna talk a little bit about our West Virginia Grown Program. This comes from our Business Development Division and it's a premier branding program here in West Virginia. Members of West Virginia Grown are able to use our West Virginia Grown logo on their products, which is a great marketing tool. This is at no cost to join the program to our producers. We're also working on a print version, a catalog of our West Virginia Grown producers so that we can share throughout the state. Um, this is a great, great way to market your business and let people be aware of that this is a West Virginia product and it really makes your product stand out. And if you'd like any more information about West Virginia Grown, there's the email down there at the bottom, or any of us planning coordinators could also help you get into that program and give you the information. We also have our Veterans and Heroes to Agriculture program. This supports uh, veterans and first responders now, which is really exciting. This is a new addition to the program. This provides them with opportunities for education, training, scholarship, and mentors. Uh, this program is statewide. Here's the contact information for you. You can call our Charleston office. We can also connect you with the Veterans Agri uh, Heroes Program and a planning coordinator in your area. So if you're interested in signing up, please contact us. And finally, we have four planning coordinators currently in West Virginia. I cover the Northern region. We have Nathan in the East and Lacey and Ashley in the Southeast and Southwest. If you are located, sorry, if anyone is on and not presenting, if you can mute, we get a little bit of feedback. So if you're located in one of the blue counties in the middle of the state, don't worry. We will help take care of you. We each have our specialties and we kind of share that center area. Again, our contacts are there on the screen. We can help you with marketing, uh, getting registered for your business, helping you see what's out there, helping you with production plans, connecting you to other resources in your area. So we can be reached at our Charleston office or you can contact one of your planning coordinators directly. Do that one. So next up, we are going to play a video from our first presenter. Her name is Milady Jane Cook. She is a young entrepreneur with half of an acre of cut flowers in Augusta, West Virginia. She enjoys being outside, being outside, outside and, working and working hard. hard. I'm the Lady Jane Cook, and my family and I are located in Hampshire County, West Virginia. My parents own Spring Valley Farm and Orchard. 
we have two markets, one in Romney, West Virginia, and then one in Winchester, Virginia. And then they also do nine farmers markets in the Washington, D.C. area. So every year in early May, we start by plowing the land, and then we disc and rototill it. And then after a few days, we lay the plastic, and then we use a water wheel transplanter to plant the flowers which are then only like four to six inches tall. And then after about three weeks, they'll have probably one flower per plant. Um, and I'll do my first cutting and then I'll bunch them. And I won't have as near, near as many as I do in the middle of the summer. But um, then the next week we'll have two flowers per plant. And then every week it gets bigger. Um, so when you cut them, you want to cut them at an angle, a 45 degree angle works. And as you can see, gosh, here, you can see the angle on it. And then, and that's so that they can get the moisture, because when you bunch them, you'll have to put them in the water so that they can dry out then so the moisture can get up the stem and all the different parts. Also, when you're doing the first cutting, you don't cut all the way down to the ground. There should be a couple little sprouts on it, and you want to cut right above the first one, so then you'll have more flowers. If you cut all the way down to the bottom, you'll just kill the plant. And every other week, I'll spray with Quadris and Permethrin for disease and bugs, but I don't have to spray for weeds because Flowers are actually really hardy against weeds. As you can see, we're filming on the back porch instead of in my field because it is full of weeds. So when I pick, I normally try to pick in the mornings between 7 and 11 before the heat hits at about 12 to 1. And then, so I'll pick three days out of the week and I mostly sell them on the weekend. So I'll pick Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And I'll try to pick anywhere from 10 to 15 bunches each, or buckets each morning. And then I'll get four bunches out of each of those buckets. Um, so I'll pick those and then after I'm done picking, I'll take them to a table and I'll set out all the buckets, which I pick by variety. So there'll be one variety in one bucket or however many buckets of that variety I have. And then so I'll spread them all out and then I'll kind of mix all the flowers together as you can see here. There's no certain ones that are together. Um, and then so each bunch sells for about six dollars. And then in the city, of course, it's a little higher. But um, so in the spring, paying for the plants and the getting all the preparation and stuff, it's a little over five hundred dollars. But then once my plants really get going and I'm picking a lot of bunches, maybe like 300 bunches a weekend, it's a lot, <laughs> um, I'll be making over $500 a week. So it's pretty profitable. All right. Thank you. That was wonderful. And that is a lot of flowers. Do we have any questions? You can either type in the chat box or unmute yourself to ask. Well, if we don't have one, I have a question. Lady Jane, which is your favorite flower to grow for ease? And which one do you think lasts the longest in an arrangement? Um, so the easiest flower to pick is probably the zinnias, but the one that I think lasts um, a long time and does a really good job like in the bunch is the sunflowers. Um, their stems are really hardy, so they don't bend or break, and then they'll last a while, so they're good for in the bunches. Great. We have another question that just came in. Is there a particular place you get the plants in the spring? So are you starting them yourself or do you purchase them? Um, so we purchase them from Johnny Seeds. Um, but 
we just transplant them. We don't start them from seeds. So Johnny Seeds has a nursery and then they'll grow them until they're six or eight inches tall. And then we'll transplant them into the ground. Okay, so you're buying them in small plug trays. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and is that also for your, for your sunflowers or do you plant any of them seed direct? Um, so the first year I did it, I planted them by seeds, but then we had some problems with like, if you just get regular sunflowers, they'll grow to be an eight foot tall plant and you'll have a sunflower that's like eight inches big or whatever. Um, so we use the baby sunflower plants and then you'll have multiple flowers on the plant and not just one. And they're smaller, so it works a lot better for the bunches. Great. And we had another quest question. Um, what varieties do you feel work best for cut flowers? Can you give us like a quick rundown of what you're growing? Um, so I have white finch, celosia, benaries, giant zinnias, red spikes, the baby sunflowers. Um, and then I also have blue, blue better saliva and blue horizon, blue horizon adriatum. Nice, that's a good selection. And do we have any more questions? We can also come back and ask Malia Jane some questions at the end. If not, we're going to move on to our next guest. And I wanna welcome Jenny Totten. Jenny currently works for both the West Virginia Community Development Hub and the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition as her day job. But she also leases two acres of land from a friend in Giles, I hope I'm saying that correct, County, Virginia, where she grows primarily wedding flowers part-time and hopes to eventually have her own spot in Appalachia where she operates a wedding and event farm. So Jenny is gonna go ahead and share a PowerPoint with us. And I'm gonna take it to you, Jenny. All right. Um, I will warn everybody, I am battling the McDowell County, West Virginia internet. So uh, if I go out at any time, somebody like holler at me and I will I will restart and it'll all be good. Um, so, and I also, while I'm doing the PowerPoint, cannot see the team's like format. So if, if you have a question or what, just interrupt or, you know, any of those things. I'll watch right. the questions for you, Jenny. It is hard, guys. She can't see. Thank you. All right. Um, so I lost my phone in the Cheat River over the weekend. So all of my videos went poof. So you guys get a lovely PowerPoint slideshow with lots of pictures. So it's going to be lovely. All right. I'm going to get started. Hopefully. Hopefully. Let's go. Sweet. All right. So that's me. Um, so I wanted to talk, since Milady talked a lot about production and a lot about um, her own process, I wanted to concentrate on kind of the bigger picture of flower farming and marketing and like why on earth you would go into cut flowers and all sorts of things. So starting with like what you would do as farm products. So a lot of folks stop with just flowers, right? So Typical flower farm products are just bulk buckets of cut flowers. Recently, especially like during the most, like we'll just call it during COVID times, uh, a lot of brides that have scaled back their weddings or a lot of folks that have scaled back events majorly are actually asking for local buckets of cut flowers. And so instead of the farmer florist having to do all the design work and having to like make the bouquet and this, that and everything else, we just simply get to cut these big five gallon buckets and sell them for like 30 to $50, depending on what's in them and say bye to them and not have to do all that extra work. So it's actually been kind of fantastic. Um, and then design bouquets, which I think is what a lot of folks think through, which is like your wedding florals, so your wedding bouquets, your bridesmaids bouquets, um, centerpieces, probably, like bunches of flowers at the farmer's market still qualify as designed bouquets, even though they're not as designed. Um, centerpieces that you would sell to a restaurant, anything like that. Um, wreaths are a huge seller for cut flower growers. Um, that's typically what most of us do as our off season uh, income. So we'll make it to about middle of October with flowers and then switch to do some fall and holiday wreaths just to get us into 
personally, I just get bored and like to still do stuff, but a lot of growers are doing it like as a large income source. Um, and then dried florals. So anything, I sell a lot of dried florals actually to a soap maker over in Blacksburg. Um, so they use the calendula, they use the lavender, they use a lot of the stuff that isn't perfect that I can then dry and just take the petals from. They'll use it in their soap making. And then a, I know a few that have used, like sold to candle makers. Um, also there's like, if you know anybody who makes their own potpourri or it's pretty easy to make your own potpourri with essential oils, it's a great use for like a great second market for the flowers that aren't perfect. Um, and I will say all the pictures in here are of things that I grew. So like I didn't attribute them to myself just to, <laughs> I'm not breaking copyright rules. We'll say that. All right. Um, so potential markets for cut flower growers. So farmers markets, usually um, most farmers markets can handle one to two cut flower growers in the state. I've noticed um, it gets a little dicey when you start to get up into three. Um, and some of the larger markets actually like limit the number of booths that can actually have flowers at their booth. The interesting thing with selling cut flowers at the farmer's market, if you're a vegetable grower, is it automatically makes your booth prettier and draws people into your booth. And so it's a fantastic way to like both decorate and make some extra income as well. Um, roadside farm side stands. These aren't as big in West Virginia, but over in Eastern Kentucky, um, and actually I'm like kind of flirting with the idea of like just taking some flowers over there and seeing what happens with another buddy of mine, but they'll set up like a pay what you want stand at the edge of their property and just have mason jar bouquets there literally all week for like five to $15. And it's a great way to get flowers into people's hands that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford them or otherwise wouldn't actually like come to the farmer's market or order them. Um, you picks, um, it works like a fruit farm. Basically the way that I've seen it done and the way that I've like experienced it is I show up with my cutter. Sometimes they have cutters for you and you pay a set price and then you get to go and cut a bouquet or cut a few bouquets. Um, the only thing to worry about here is liability. And then like, if you're letting people, it's the same as with like vegetable you picks where letting people into your field also means you're letting people into your flowers, which could potentially ruin your flowers. If say a dog tramples or you, you know, somebody takes something they shouldn't, et cetera. And it's also a great, easy business model if you have the space for it. Um, selling to other local businesses. I know I mentioned restaurants. Um, I have not right now, but in the past, before the pandemic came, had several restaurant contracts, like tiny restaurants, like the little restaurants in South West Virginia and Southern West Virginia, where I would just, we had like rotating pint-sized mason jars where I would drop off 10 each week and then we would trade them out the following week for 10 of just a lot of my like lesser, like a lot of my just extra flowers and they would pay three to five dollars a piece for each of them and so it's just an easy way on my route home to like just make use of the flowers i will say right now most of those flowers are just going to my neighbors right so it's like flower bombing the neighborhood um other florists are gr a great outlet especially for flowers that don't do well in shipping so most commercial florists buy their flowers off of a wholesaler trade um and most of those are being shipped truthfully from either africa or from south america and a lot of those flowers ship really well. So like roses, for example, I don't grow roses because they're so much cheaper just to get from somewhere else. However, flowers that don't travel well, like your zinnias, your calendulas, in some cases your dahlias, it, selling to florists locally, it allows them to have more product. It allows them to have a more diverse bouquet selection. And typically the prices are better for them than trying to get zinnia shipped from somewhere else. Um, of course, event and wedding design. The thing that I want to say here is practice, practice, practice before you just get started um, and start very small. So my first year growing, which was, I don't know, my first year commercially growing, which was six years ago, I did like five weddings and they were all my friends. And then the next year I did like, 15 weddings and they were all friends of friends of friends of friends. And then the following year, I thought it was going to have to be my main income. 
And so I bit off way more than I could chew and tried to do like 75 weddings in a year. And everybody was exhausted at the end of it. I had to hire some help. Um, and so I learned my lesson the hard way. And so I kind of have scaled back to where I, I will not do more than like 20 to 25 weddings or major events in a season. Um, and then of course, makers. So folks that do soap, folks that do candles, folks that like sew and want to do lavender sachets. Um, any of those are game for, to purchase your flowers, whether they're dried or fresh. Um, so this is what a season looks like on my flower farm. Um, and keep in mind, I'm growing on two acres. Most flower farms are between like a quarter acre up to about five acres because it is so intensive. So I'm like right in the middle. Um, so I have major events at the top that people like, like flowers for, and then like, the to-dos at the bottom that I typically go through. So I won't read it all to you, but I will tell you, I don't do anything for Valentine's Day. I know folks who do. I know folks who try to push to get some of the early season flowers under plastic and get them out for Valentine's Day. Um, to me, because I have another job and because I'm so focused on like wedding season and so focused on the later parts of the year, it's just not worth it. Um, also, I only have I only have use of one like high tunnel. And so it's more important for me to get everything started under that tunnel and get ready for transplant than it is to have flowers for Valentine's Day. So what I typically do in January and February, um, this is also when I'll take like some extended time away. So, you know, farmers can never leave town for more than three days. Um, so I'll try to take a week or two in January, February just to like chill out and get ready. But I typically do my seed starting. I'll do pre-orders for any events. So at this point, if I know that somebody is like, not just weddings, but at this point, if I know somebody is like wanting to do a reception or wanting to do like a fundraiser or whatnot, and they've already like been like, hey, Jenny, can you do the flowers for this? Da, 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 which is typically how it happens. Um, I'll go ahead and start listing like the pre-order so I know what to grow. Um, and then I'll... In the event that I do have somebody that wants a contract, which I will tell you it's few and far between, um, I'll make sure that we get those signed in January, February. Um, March and April, I sometimes hit Easter with flowers and sometimes I don't. So it depends on how the tulips and the daffodils and the hyacinths and all of those early bulbs come up. Um, I have a hard time in the Southern coal fields and over in Southwest Virginia of getting any sort of like any sort of stem length that is like long enough to use for a large bouquet. So I'll do a lot of little tiny like pop in flowers for um, like little mason jar bouquets for Easter. Um, then starts wedding season and Mother's Day and farmers markets all at once. So like almost May through about early September, it's all about like just getting, keeping up basically. So it's like you cut, and, you know, Milady talks about cutting three times a week. I typically cut three times a week and usually like I'll cut Wednesday night for a wedding and then Thursday, Friday for any case that's not a wedding. Um, so, yeah. We're getting a little bit of time if everyone can mute themselves. <laughs> um, and so it's it's kind of like just to catch up. I basically like move over to my friend's farm in Giles County for like Wednesday through Saturday of every week in a typical year. Now this has not been a typical season because of COVID, but. Typically, I'm over there from, like, Wednesday night until Saturday morning, and then I'll come on back over to my house in McDowell. Um, and so it's basically about keeping up in the summer months. And then starting in, like, September, October, I will start to – all season, that basically, I have, like, anything extra, I've just hung to dry. And so starting in, like, late August, September, October, I'll do some fall-dried wreaths that I sell. And then in late October, I will pull greenery – to, and get it in the cooler because the interesting thing with most of your evergreens is if you can keep it cool it'll stay green for three to five months um if you can keep it cool and so i'll just get it in the cooler and start to work with it in late october early november and be ready for christmas trees so that's what my season looks like um 
I, so my video was an awesome video of me showing you how to make a five minute bouquet. Really, like for me, it's about a two minute bouquet, but you know, lost the video. So I just wanna do some tips for floral arranging. My first tip is like not even on here, which is don't stress about it. Um, often when you try to control things too much, it doesn't look natural. So that's my first like blanket rule. Uh, the next one is go to the Dollar Tree and get yourself like $20 worth of fake flowers and just practice with the fake flowers. Um, if it is something that you're into and you want to like do wedding florals or you want to do centerpiece design or you want to even just like make centerpieces and you don't want to waste product, spend this winter practicing with some fake flowers. If you want the really nice fake flowers, go to Hobby Lobby. But I always I'm like, just go to Dollar Tree. Um, look at Pinterest. Pinterest is great because every single bride makes a board on Pinterest, right? Of things that they're interested in. Um, Pinterest also does a really good job of kind of forecasting trends. So you'll get to know like what colors are coming, what, um, what people are into as far as decorative stuff goes and kind of what wedding themes are coming along and also, sort of what people are doing in their houses in the next year. So you can kind of like, if you're that person who designs all your stuff for the farmer's market, you'll have everything ready. Um, my next big tip is if you don't like what it looks like, just keep adding more stuff. So this is the case where the oftentimes, you know, they say too much is a good thing. The interesting thing is with flowers and kind of with arrangements in general, probably 90% of the time it doesn't look good because it's not full enough. Um, you know, stab some greener in there, stab some extra like low cost flowers, et cetera, until you get, until you just get it to where you think it looks good. And usually if your eye likes it, somebody else's eye will like it. Um, the next thing, if you're doing wedding bouquets, put them in your hand and build them as you go. That way you're not going to make a bouquet that's too heavy for the bride. And the worst thing to do is to make a bouquet that is off balance that a bride has to fight with to carry down the aisle. Cause like you'll see it in all of her pictures. Um, so that way it'll help you make sure it's balanced and it's not too heavy. Um, I'm not afraid of color and I will say just like own it. Don't be afraid of color. Um, you know, it's one thing when the bride's saying these are my colors, but if you're doing farmer's market bouquets, if you're doing centerpiece bouquets for restaurants, if you're just doing centerpiece bouquets for a wedding, don't be afraid to mix the colors. You know, orange and pink and yellow look great together. Add in a blue flower. It looks pretty. Um, always take pictures of your work. This is something that I've learned for the first couple of weddings that like I consider big weddings, real weddings. I was sort of relying on the photographer and the pictures that they took to then showcase my work. And what it came down to was like, you know, they're not there to showcase your florals. They're there to showcase the bride and groom and the wedding. And so the f pictures were beautiful and yet they weren't exactly what I needed for a lookbook. And so I, and your handy dandy iPhone will take good enough pictures, right? You don't need a super fancy camera. Um, but then that gives you stuff to share on social media. That gives you stuff to like send to your friends. That gives you examples. I oftentimes have the bride that's like, I don't actually know what I want and I don't like Pinterest. So blah, blah, blah. And I'll be like, okay, let me send you 10 very different bouquets. You pick the top three and we'll start there. So it'll, it gives you like a library for that. And then um, I keep talking about mason jar bouquets, but in reality, probably 80% of the mason jars that I use are like jelly jars or spaghetti sauce jars or jars from like Frappuccinos from Starbucks. So like, don't be afraid to recycle glass jars. Just wash them, rinse them. You know, if you have a if you have a dishwasher, run them through the dishwasher. If not, throw a little bit of bleach in there, and they're good to go. Um, getting your friends to save stuff for you saves you a lot of money in the long run. All right, so I'm going to start talk about the last thing I'm going to talk about are kind of the three different products that most flower growers will go into, and sort of how to build them. Um, so market bouquets. I think this is the easiest to start with. Um, they typically don't rely on your ability to arrange. And so folks are not as scared of them. What people usually don't do though is put enough flowers or enough greenery in them. 
So the way that you do this is you're going to harvest all your flowers. You're going to divide them up equally based on, you know, if you have 300, if you're making like 300 bunches this week, you're just going to divide them up equally as best you can. Um, and either wrap with a plastic or a paper sleeve, which you can get from Johnny's. You can, if you're doing paper, you can build those yourself. Um, there's a million tutorials on YouTube about how to make your own market sleeves. Um, cut the ends at a 45 degree angle and put them in a bucket of water so people will buy them out of the bucket. Or what I do typically is, because I hate dealing with sleeves and it's just, it, it feels like too much work, is I'll take a jar and kind of do what Milady does and just put put the flowers in the jar and sell them that way. Um, most markets in West Virginia if will pull about 15 to $25 for a large market bouquet. This picture is actually a bouquet that I did um, up in Pocahontas County. And that ended up being about a $35 bouquet at that market. Um, it was a flower farmer off. So like a flower girl up there and I were like basically designing flowers for charity um, as a fundraiser. And so we would make bouquets. People would watch us race and make bouquets and then they would bid on them. Um, and so that's a much larger bouquet than I typically do. Uh, most market bouquets that I've done have between 40, between 25 and 40 stems in them based on like what the stem looks, based on like whether it's a greenery or whether it's a low impact flower or spike or like, you know, a major focal flower. Lacey might recognize these wedding florals. They're from her wedding. Um, so how to build wedding florals. I say start with three to five, what I call showy flowers. The wedding industry calls them like focal flowers. Uh, these are your flowers that are just big and pretty. So roses, dahlias, peonies, um, some poppies. I never have good luck with poppies in a bouquet of any kind. Um, and then some of your, if you're doing like succulents, if you're wiring like hens and chicks in, sometimes they count as showy. So I start with three to five of these flowers and then fill in with other flowers around it in a similar color scheme in my hand. And then I'll go to like greenery. So like ferns, I'm notorious. I have like six ferns that live on my front porch and I just like take one down and take it with me to the wedding to cut from and then bring it back. Um, Oftentimes you can find greenery by the side of the road. Um, so fill in with greenery and then some spiky flowers or grasses. I always add these because they'll add texture and a little bit of height. So they'll make it look, they'll make it look a little bit diverse instead of just being this like rounded bouquet. Um, I always build it in my hand so I can feel the weight. Uh, for beginners, and actually I still do this because I, the last thing I want is for a bouquet to like explode on the, its way down the aisle. Um, I rubber band at the very top of the stem and then I'll tie the ribbon around that later. Um, so I clip the bottom to leave five to eight inches of stem and clip them at 45 degree angles. I don't clip it so that all the stems are equal across the bottom. I make it so that there's a little bit of like a curve to it. It just, to me, it looks more finished. Um, I utilize, here's where I like go to the Dollar Tree or Dollar Store and just grab a bunch of those dollar vases. I use those as water holders so that way if I'm not at the wedding, so like it's somebody who's contacted me that's not a friend, I can just leave them and I don't have to, I haven't spent a lot of money and I don't have to actually like go back and get everything. Um, depending on the size of the wedding, depending on the flowers, depending on a lot of things, uh, the cheapest wedding I've done was $125. The most expensive wedding I did was $1,500. Um, the $1,500 one included all the centerpieces for the reception too, though. So that was a little, that's a little misleading. Um, the other thing I want to say is like, it is fantastic and amazing and wonderful to be able to say, I grew everything in your bouquet. And the likelihood of that, except for about four months out of the year in West Virginia is really, is like very low. So don't be afraid to order flowers. Don't be afraid to reach out to other flower farmers you know to see if they have, especially if they're like a few counties north or south of you, to see if they have different flowers than you have at the time. Um, there's like this unspoken rule amongst, I think, most of the southern 
floggers down here where we're just like, hey, you got that? Okay, I'll buy it from you. Um, and I said, if your business model and values are okay with that, I know some flower growers build their entire business model off of like what they can produce. But again, like, don't be afraid to order. There are plenty of really good, sustainable wholesale flower growers around the country that you can order from too. Um, what I'm going to say is deliver the day before, if at all possible, or take everything with you and build them there the day before. If it, especially if it's an outdoor wedding, sometimes it's easier just to set up a pop-up table and do it there so you're not having to worry about transporting like finished florals. Um, at site, check to make sure cold storage is there. And it doesn't have to be a traditional cold storage cooler, right? So what we've learned is catering fridges work great for this. And oftentimes, catering fridges are very empty until the morning of the wedding. And so you're going to want to take the flowers out in the morning so that they finish opening anyways. So it's kind of a perfect use of their equipment as well. Um, I also want to say... So structural florals are things like if you're putting flowers on an archway, if you're making like a massive like veil with flowers on it, et cetera, practice any of those before the day of. Um, even if you're confident in your abilities, oftentimes it like helps to figure out the weighting, to figure out how much wire you're actually going to need and so on. I usually try to do it a couple of weeks beforehand. I'll get the flowers that I intend on using and just sort of play around with them to make sure it's all going to work. Um, a thing that I have started doing, um, is keeping a running list of who gets what, because if you're making boutonnieres, they have to have a boutonniere pin, right? If you're making hair combs and only the bride gets the hair comb, but then somebody else gets something else, it all gets really confusing. And so I bought these, like, they're like Rubbermaid containers, but like the cheapo version of them that I just put a list of, I put the person's name on the front and I put everything that they're getting and so as I go and I make the florals, even if I have help, it's all very organized and we know who's getting what and where it's going. Um, it also like makes it look very finished for the bride. All right, the final major product um, are wreaths. So the cool thing with wreaths is you don't have to pay much for the materials and it doesn't really cost anything for the raw material. Um, so it's okay to use wreath forms and floral wire starting out. There are, you know, you can hand tie a wreath without a wire form behind it. And I say, if you're great at that, do that. If not, just buy the 10 cent wreath forms and you're good to go. Um, don't be afraid to add twinkle lights or glitter. People love it. Um, you might be glittered for days, but it's okay. Um, and then mixing different kinds of greenery to add texture. The, one of the most frustrating things for me is to walk into Lowe's in like late November and see all their wreaths for $15 and to look and just like the whole entire wreath is just Douglas fir. And it is the most frustrating thing ever because it's a boring wreath, right? So I always say mix different kinds of greenery. Um, traditional wreaths like the one over that's shown here they're made by like wiring the same bunch of materials around the wreath again and again and again. So I'll make essentially a bouquet of greenery and just make like 20 of those and just wire them around the wreath to make a full wreath. Um, typically you can get between 25 to $80 per wreath in West Virginia. Um, I, this is kind of holiday markets are like, a hidden gem for flower growers right so like you don't have anything going on you're a little bored you have all this greenery around you you might as well just do it um the interesting thing that i've had happen is i sold a couple of reeds in mcdowell county two years ago three years ago at this point and it was to one of the uh she's a member of the catholic church down here and i go to church with her and uh the next thing i know they're asking me to make 20 wreaths a year for the church to decorate. And so it's an interesting way to get more business. And then you end up like almost in the interior design and decorating industry for a few months out of the year. Um, but it's a nice break from, from flowers if you need that. All right, there's me. If anybody needs to, to find me, um, I, We'll stop sharing now so we can have questions if I can figure out how to do this.
There we go. This is my first time on Teams, everybody. <laughs> We'd love to see you now. I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that was wonderful. I feel like I learned so much. I see some great questions coming in. Um, the first one we have is, what is the ideal temperature range to keep your flowers overnight storage? Oh, um, I never have ideal, but I will tell you what makes them survive. Uh, anywhere between 45 and like the low 60s. Um, most of your flower coolers at floral shops are running at between like 40 and 45 though, but they'll keep storage for weeks at that temperature. Okay. So just so we're keeping them cold. I mean, just yeah. really, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I have been known to like, I mean, this is a terrible way to describe it, but like, I don't have a cool bot system. I just have a window air conditioner. And so if I just shove everything in one room and close the door, that's enough to keep everything overnight just fine. Great. Um, this one is, if I'm just getting started, what do you suggest for ground prep? Ideal pH, et cetera. Do you use raised beds or mounding? Ha, ah, so the beauty of flowers is they don't care. Um, that is like my biggest push for flower, for like growing some flowers. Um, pH is, they don't like it too acidic. So stick around six and a half if you can or higher. Um, basically if a vegetable can grow in it, a flower can grow in it. Um, I personally have grown in both raised beds and like almost the hugoculture mounds because of the way that we were kind of trying to get the land ready. Um, I prefer the mounding method for flowers, especially because kind of like Milady said, you don't really need to worry about weed pressure and raised beds are just an extra like layer of chaos to have to manage for flowers. Um, the mounds will let you go in with a tractor and prep everything or even a large tiller and prep everything easily. Great. Um, this one's from me. Do you think there is an opportunity at farmer's markets for selling single stems, sunflowers, or likewise, or allowing customers to make their own arrangements on site? So, um, places that aren't Southern West Virginia, yes. <laughs> um, I've seen it work. Uh, so the Bridgeport Farmer's Market a few years ago had somebody who did that, and it worked really well there where they could make their own bouquets, or really what happened was they ended up pointing at the flowers and the the flower grower ended up making the bouquet for them. Um, I've seen some really creative models. Um, single stem sunflowers sell pretty well. Like you can get two to three dollars a stem for them down here. And then I've seen some interesting models. So the Perry County Farmers Market over in like Hazard, Kentucky, they actually have a flower grower that'll bring in like, I don't know, 20 different buckets of flowers. And people just go through and you pay $30, you bring your own jar, and it's a party. Um, and so the whole booth is just people making their flower bouquets for the week. And the person's there to, like, help with advice, da 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 But it's really a, like, make and take. It's more like a socialization make and take art activity than it is a flower bouquet activity, which is great. Um, and it's fantastic. And they've, like, had... I don't know, that, that particular grower, like, kills it with that that process. That's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. I've seen it a few years ago at the Wheeling Farmer's Market. People just kind of enjoyed hanging out, picking their flowers. And so maybe that's a good suggestion for someone entry level that maybe doesn't have the confidence in designing. Let your customers tell you what they like. Yeah, and I mean, here's the interesting thing is no matter what, you're going to be, like, the expert, no matter what, whether you see yourself as one or not. So just own it. Um, the other thing I've seen that was really creative that they've done over there is the town of Hazard has, they call it the art station, but it's basically their community center. And once a month they do like, like, you know how we have like sip and wine, sip and paint nights over here. They have like sip and plant, sip and design your flowers, da da da. So they set up a flower bar. Um, and so people like come and drink wine and play with flowers all night and pay lots, a considerable amount of money for it. It's pretty cool. Nice. We have another question here. What flowers do you grow and where do you get your starts? 
Yeah, so I don't start anything, um, or I start everything. I don't actually buy starts. Um, I have in the past some of my perennials I bought plug trays of. Um, so I have... I have a couple of rows of tulips and daffodils just to get through the early season and because like I can't let go of them. Um, and then my tulips have come from Florette Flower. Uh, she's a grower in Washington State. She kind of wrote the book on specialty flower growing for small growers. Um, she literally has a book now. Um, she's fantastic and is like willing to share with the community of flower growers across the world. Um, and then my daffodils I've ordered from her and then Johnny's just doing some bulk like white and yellow daffs. Um, as for seeds, I grow a little bit of everything, but my big, my biggest producers that end up in bouquets are my zinnias. So I grow probably 20 different varieties of zinnias because I love them so much. Um, my piece of advice to flower growers is grow what you love. If it makes you giggle, grow it. If it doesn't, don't grow it. I don't care how much money it'll bring in because you won't take care of it. Um, I have sunflowers. I probably have five or six varieties of sunflowers. I do cosmos, which are like, they look very delicate, but they're not. So they end up with this long, like, twisty bendy stem and there's this beautiful little pink or orange or white flower at the end that looks very delicate and really it's not so all it does is add like some texture and add some like 3d-ness to your bouquets or your arrangements um i love growing those i grow five or six different colors of solosia which are like the fluffy spiky things um i do grow a considerable amount of amaranth um in a lot of different colors because that drapes really well and so in wedding bouquets you have it's like really really in to have droopiness in your wedding bouquets now and so if somebody doesn't want ferns and they want some color adding the amaranth makes perfect sense um and it's typically a grain but i grow it as flowers i grow a lot of ornamental grasses for texture so i have like sea oats i have all of the curly cue grasses um and things like that and lemongrass and then I also have a lot of the herbs that flower. So I have um, lavender. I have, I'll even like tuck flowering mint into bouquets. Um, I have a lot of like basil makes a great green filler. So I have a lot of that. And then I have a, and then as far as like my perennials, I have tons of peonies planted because they're massively popular for wedding season. I have five or six different varieties of hydrangea in three or four rows. So I have like probably 20 hydrangea plants of each variety that are just like down the row. Um, and then I grow thornless blackberry as a perennial to actually use the greens off of the blackberry plant. Um, and that's like, those are my big, like what I typically grow. I do order garden roses from other people. So if somebody locals growing garden roses when I need them, I'll get them. But otherwise, I'll just order them from a bulk wholesaler. Um, and then for my spikiness stuff, I grow five or six different colors of stock. Um, and then the celosia sometimes adds spikiness. And then I grow a lot of snapdragons to give me like a full season of something with a little bit of height to it. Wow, that was a lot of stuff. It's, um, it's <laughs> we had a question again what was the name of the author of the book the flower at farm um if you just oh i am blanking on her name give me like 20 seconds and out it's erin it's floret f-l-o-r-e-t and her first name is erin uh let's see And while she's looking, does anybody have any other questions? That was so much great information. Or Milady is still with us. If anybody has any questions from Lady Jane. Did we find that name? It is. Yeah, I'm just going to email it to you, Casey, because it's like okay. Zinkin. It is like impossible to spell or pronounce. <laughs> OK, or you can drop it there in the chat box. Oh, I can. We'll just do okay. that. There okay. we and we want to thank you so much for joining us. That was so much wonderful information. I'm going to share one last slide here. Maybe my PowerPoint will come up. So next week we have another great episode. We're going to be talking about pasture pork and processing. 
with Tim Yates of Steel House Farm, and that will be next week at six o'clock on Tuesday. And if anyone has any additional questions, um, we can get those to Jenny or Milady Jane. And we really thank you both for joining us. That was really, really interesting. And thank you. And everyone have a good evening. Thank you, Jenny.